Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Leading Through Crisis Thought Leadership webinar series. I'm Pierre Yard. I'm a professor and vice dean at the Business School and also co-director of the Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy, which is co-sponsoring this very interesting and important event, which is a discussion of what the Federal Reserve has been doing in recent weeks and its impact on the overall economy. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Kate Davidson from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Kate Davidson has been writing about the Fed as well as the US economy for the Wall Street Journal since 2015. And prior to that, she was covering bank regulation and policy at Political and American Banker. Kate will be introducing our panelists and she will be moderating the discussion. I'd like to remind you all that the Q&A box will be open throughout our webinar if you want to provide uh, questions for, uh, for Kate as well as our panelists. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Pierre. And uh, thanks to Columbia for inviting me to moderate this terrific panel. We'll be talking today, as Pierre said, about the Fed's emergency credit programs, the old ones uh, and the new ones, and how they've been used to stabilize markets and bolster the economy during the coronavirus pandemic, whether or not they're working, and what are the longer term risks of these programs. So joining us for this discussion is Rick Mishkin, the Alfred Lerner Professor of Banking and Financial Institutions at the Graduate School of Business at Columbia. And of course, um, a former Fed governor, he served at the board from 2006 to 2008. Rick is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and has also been a senior fellow at the FDIC Center for Banking Research and is a past president of the Eastern Economic Association. We also have Patricia Mosser, Director of the MPA Program in Economic Policy Management at Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs, and she leads the school's initiative on central banking and financial policy. Previously, Trish was head of the Research and Analysis Center at the Treasury Department's Office of Financial Research, and she spent over 20 years at the New York Fed, where she was a senior manager at the Fed's open market desk, overseeing market analysis, monetary policy implementation, including many crisis-related facilities, foreign exchange operations, and analysis of financial stability and reform. So Rick and Trish are gonna give some opening remarks and share their thoughts and then we'll dive into questions. Um, and as Pierre said, we'll, we'll uh, have audience questions. We'll leave plenty of time at the end for that. So um, please don't be shy, use those Q and A boxes um, and, and share um, things that you wanna know. So um, I think we'll get started uh, with um, Rick, if you'd like to go ahead. Hi, hi everybody. So, uh, I want to give you the big picture here uh, about the decision-making uh, process uh, that also uh, indicate uh, how important it was what the, the, what the Fed did. Uh, and uh, I'll probably leave to Trish is actually more of an expert on the actual programs. She, she was involved in implementing them. Uh, so, you know, Trish actually I would work for me when I was an executive vice president at the uh, New York Fed and is actually a colleague. I uh, was a colleague when I first came to Columbia and, uh, uh, and actually is now a colleague again. So it's great to be on a panel with her. So uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you something that there's sort of good news and bad news from the situation we're in now. So the bad news is that we've gotten this coronavirus pandemic, and, which is a real disaster. Uh, and also to be, you know, I think uh, up front, uh, some of the leadership that we've had uh, uh, in terms of actually containing the virus has been very problematic. But I want to actually talk about a very good news aspect of this uh, and to, to uh, point out that in a sense we are incredibly lucky about the timing of the pandemic uh, now rather than having had this uh, before the, the what we, we refer to as the global financial crisis, the financial crisis that started in the U.S. in uh, 2007 and basically lasted to 2009 throughout the world. Uh, which of course is very devastating, but I want to actually argue that if we had the crisis of this pandemic had occurred uh, in 2007 or 2006 before uh, the global financial crisis, uh, it would have been much, much more disastrous uh, and potentially could have led to a depression uh, uh, and things could have been very bad. So I want to actually sort of give you the good news aspect of, 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 of the virus occurring now uh, and the basic uh, issue here is that the response of actually the Federal Reserve, which we'll talk about uh, in detail here, but also actually uh, the federal government in terms of uh, economic response and policy response uh, was 
uh, very, very different than what occurred uh, at the initial stages of the global financial crisis, and has actually been critical to the fact that uh, the crisis has been so contained uh, uh, in terms of the effect on the economy. Of course, we're not over that yet because uh, the, because of the fact that the, virus, the coronavirus pandemic has actually now uh, sort of uh, reflamed itself in the United States. And that's a whole other issue. So we don't know, we're not out of this yet, but, uh, but there's nothing that, that, uh, that uh, economic policy uh, uh, could have done about that. So let me give you a, a, a picture of, uh, of why I'm saying this. So the first issue that I think is really important is how remarkably fast both the Federal Reserve and also the Congress and the, and the, uh, uh, the White House reacted in terms of economic policies. So, you know, you take it back. I remember I was ready to go on vacation on March 8th and actually uh, canceled uh, uh, the vacation, uh, actually was gonna go away on March 10th and then canceled it. So that's how recent things really became clear. The pandemic wasn't announced to March 11th. Uh, and uh, we're gonna see that the two things happened. The Federal Reserve actually had a meeting on, FOMC meeting on February, on March 15th, which is basically within a week of, of recognition how bad this was gonna be. Uh, and actually uh, implemented policies that were incredibly important in terms of the, the uh, economy reacting as well as it has. And by the way, I'll talk about this a little bit. It's not really the focus of this talk, but, but it's also remarkable what, what happened in Congress. Congress actually passed a bill, the CARE Act, of over $2 trillion of expansionary fiscal policy, again, within a week. Extraordinary, particularly because of the partisanship in Congress. So it's just, it's extraordinary. So I wanna go into this a little bit and we'll probably discuss this even more. Uh, I'm gonna focus on one issue here, which is the fact that we've had a dress rehearsal for this crisis. Uh, uh, there's another reason why I think things happen so fast, uh, but it, it has to do with moral hazard, more complicated. Maybe we'll get to that in, in, uh, in the discussion. So when we look at this, uh, that uh, uh, the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is why was the Federal Reserve able to act so fast? And I'll argue the government as well. And the answer was that the, the global financial crisis was basically a dress rehearsal for, uh, for actions taken, uh, uh, taken uh, in, in March. And what's extremely important in terms of thinking about this is uh, to think about what the process was uh, during the global financial crisis, how much slower it was. But uh, we're going to see that, in a sense, uh, there was a learning uh, by doing in the, in the global financial crisis. Uh, and as a result, the Fed was actually able to act incredibly fast. And I'm going to argue it basically took what it learned in, uh, uh, during the global financial crisis with its liquidity facilities and put them on steroids, expanded them very, very dramatically and incredibly rapidly. And so Trish can talk more about the details of this, but, but I want to give you the big, 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 big picture. So let's actually go back a little bit and think about what happened during the global financial crisis. And one of the good things about this, uh, from my talking about this is that I was a fly on the, on the wall. I was actually in the FOMC meetings uh, uh, in the first phase of this crisis. I left before Lehman Brothers, but actually saw, uh, saw what, um, uh, what happened. Uh, and uh, what's very key to understand is that it took quite a while for the Fed to put all its programs in place. So let's think about what happens. August 2007 uh, is the first beginning of the financial crisis with a problem uh, with BNB Paribas. Uh, and uh, if you think about the Fed's actions, the Fed did not lower interest rates of the federal funds rate, its federal funds rate target, to zero for over a year afterwards. It took a year to do it. The secondly, they also started putting in a whole uh, slew of, uh, of liquidity facilities, which we'll talk about here in, in great detail. Uh, Trish will too, uh, but, but they put in a slew of credit facilities, but again, um, many of those facilities took over a year to put together. And, and in fact, uh, there was a lot of experimentation there. Chris, uh, Trish may want to talk about this. She was actually uh, in the trenches with the experimentation. The way I viewed it when I was in the, at, 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 uh, on the Federal Reserve Board was that we were basically in a, in a mode of throwing things against the wall hopefully doing intelligent things to throw so that they had higher probability and then see if they stuck. So the good work of people like Trish and other people was to give us a higher probability that the things would work, but a lot of them didn't. And they realized that we had to do uh, much more. So actually on August 10th of 2007, I was at an FOMC meeting 
uh, which was done virtually, by the way, uh, uh, where we actually took some actions. We actually uh, uh, lowered the, dis the discount rate, the lending rate of the normal uh, facility for Fed lending. Uh, we lowered it 50 basis points. It turned out it didn't work. So what was happening was that there was a continual experimentation with, uh, with uh, new programs to try to deal with, the, deal with the problem. And it took a long time. And part of the reason it took a long time is that uh, many of the members, I would say three quarters of FOMC participants, now so you know the FOMC is the uh, decision-making body of the Federal Reserve. Uh, it has the, the chair uh, uh, and the other six governors uh, who actually uh, are, are, are always vote. And then it has five bank presidents who vote, but all the bank presidents, Federal Reserve bank presidents participate as well. So if there's a full staff at the, at the board, which there wasn't, uh, it would be 19 people, seven governors plus 12 Federal Reserve banks participating. Three quarters of those people were clueless when this happened. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, really things didn't get going. That, that, uh, uh, we have to give tremendous credit to, to Ben Bernanke for his leadership. Uh, I think I helped as well. I can give you an instance of, of why it took uh, time. So uh, in December of 2007, uh, uh, my view was that things were really starting to go uh, off the rails and that we were really in real trouble. Uh, and uh, we had an FOMC meeting at the time. And uh, uh, the decision that the, me the meeting was for a 25 basis point cut in the federal funds rate. Uh, I felt very strongly that we were behind the curve, that this was a classic financial crisis. Uh, I had studied one, one of my big research programs was a uh, history of financial crises. Uh, uh, I really liked this stuff because it was so, uh, you know, it, it has skullduggery and, and dirty words that aren't really dirty words like defalcation, which just means committing fraud. Uh, that, uh, that I studied this. And of course, we had Ben Bernanke, who, who uh, really made his, uh, uh, his career on actually his famous paper that really uh, set him as a top uh, uh, economist was a paper on the Great Depression financial crisis. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I wanted to move faster. And Ben basically, uh, we discussed this before the meeting. We decided, Ben said, look, uh, I think I can only get the committee to do 25. I said, I feel very strongly about this. Uh, we talked about it. I actually said I would like to dissent because I think we need more, but we then decided to dis uh, dissent from a governor is actually a very big deal uh, in the media, and we didn't want to create that problem. It might look like I wasn't supportive of Ben. I was very supportive of Ben. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, within a week afterwards, by the way, we did this. Ben came to me and said, Rick, you were right. We need to do more. And then we actually started cutting, really started cutting rates very fast, starting in January of 2008. So you can see that it just took a while. By the way, this might have been the right strategy for Ben because he had to get the whole committee to move with him. So Ben understood what was going on. Uh, there were a few members of the FOMC participants that understood, but a lot of people were really clueless. It took time for them to learn. Uh, and then, of course, uh, all this experimentation meant it also took time to even, even if you knew it, you had to do something, it wasn't easy to figure out how to set up these programs. So maybe Trish could talk about how difficult it was to figure these things out, but uh, that was a very big deal, uh, big deal as well. So one of the key things is that basically the financial crisis occurred. It was a dress rehearsal because the Fed basically took a long time to get everything uh, going, but they learned from this. They learned, first of all, they better act fast. The faster, the better. In fact, they were too slow, uh, but I would argue still did a great job. Uh, and also it just took a while to put these facilities together. They're actually very complicated. You have to worry about uh, uh, how do you do it so that you don't get, uh, that you make good loans and you actually support the economy instead of doing things that are wrong. You also realize that some things that you start, they just don't work. You got to try something else. So that's the idea that they're basically doing intelligent throwing against the things against the wall and seeing if they stick. So, uh, so uh, uh, let's think about um, uh, 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 this in terms of, of, uh, of, of what then happened in the, in the current environment. So in the current environment, the Fed basically starts to, to realize that, that uh, things are getting bad in terms of the pandemic. This is, I remember going to a conference very shortly at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, uh, maybe a better week uh, before uh, the pandemic was declared, maybe a little bit more in 10 days. And they started talking, you know, we actually started work thinking about what to do, uh, given this. Uh, you should know that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where both Trish and, and I uh, uh, worked, that uh, is, is uh, really the point man for the Federal Reserve System in terms of dealing with financial markets. So what happened here instead was that the, basically it's about, I would say March 8th, 10th, something around that range of people realize that this is going to be a very big deal. 
March 15th, the Federal Reserve uh, has an FOMC meeting and they announce a huge set of programs. Now, what's key about this is that these programs were basically taking off the shelf what had been set up uh, 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 um, more than 10 years before, and then also recognized that uh, they had to go beyond that. Uh, and uh, I'll argue that, that that was exactly right for this episode, not right for the global financial crisis. But in fact, they expanded the program. They took the same program, same names, many of them, uh, and, uh, and then created new ones, which were modeled after them. And then what they did is they said, we're announcing them, and these things were in operation within a couple of weeks. The reason I say that this is uh, the credit facilities were on steroids, and by the way, they also cut rates to zero on March 15th. So basically within a week, they did what, what took a year during the global financial crisis. So uh, uh, incredibly fast. Uh, and why do I say that it's, it's uh, lending facilities or credit facilities on steroids? Because they now took the same models and extended them to whole new sectors of the financial system. The municipal bond market, small business, uh, uh, small business loans. Uh, so uh, taking them in areas, and, and Trish is going to discuss this uh, uh, in, in, in uh, quite a more uh, detail, also buying private securities, corporate bonds. So this is a huge, major expansion of their uh, activities. But they already had the template. They already uh, uh, knew what they were doing. So the bottom line is that if they had not done this, uh, it would have been a disaster because uh, the uh, uh, potential for escalating bankruptcies uh, and uh, uh, collapse of the financial system was very high. So my view is if the Fed didn't do this, if the Fed had not done what it did during the global financial crisis, the financial crisis would have been much worse, would have created a depression. We got actually closer than most people would like to know, but, but we, we, we got by. In this case, they actually prevented a financial crisis because the financial system kept working without the problems that occurred. You can actually see this in what we call credit spreads, which is the difference between uh, lower grade bonds and, and things like the uh, uh, default free securities, like treasury securities, uh, went up sharply uh, 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 in, in March. And then as soon as these programs got rolling and were, were uh, announced, they came back down very sharply. So we really, the one thing we have not had as a problem in this case is the financial system seizing up. This was critical. Did it work? You betcha. I mean, without this, uh, uh, as I think it was uh, one of the, the uh, senior Bush said, we would be in deep doo doo. Uh, this would have been uh, 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 an absolute disaster. So let me just quickly, before I turn things over to Trish, uh, argue that, that a similar thing actually happened with the, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the Congress. So think about the following, which is that. Uh, one of the key events that occurred to the global financial crisis, which made it much, much, much worse, uh, is uh, the fact that the government basically, uh, after Lehman Brothers, came up with a plan, uh, that, uh, uh, the TARP uh, uh, plan, uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, and uh, they brought it to Congress. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the mistakes that were made, the way it was brought to Congress. I also think there were uh, the actual design of the program initially was a disaster, but had one element in it which allowed them to do the right thing. The idea of, of buying troubled assets was absolutely the wrong thing to do. But on the other hand, uh, it turned out that there was a part of it that said you could use it to recapitalize the banking system. And this was critical to the, to the uh, financial crisis uh, uh, being limited. But it was brought to Congress and it was turned down by Congress. And many people think that you know, it's, it's this Lehman Brothers that, that blew up the whole thing. Lehman Brothers occurred but it was actually this, the, the fact that, that uh, uh, the TARP was turned down, which said we can't trust the government. And also then the very, very close follow on of AIG going broke, which said, how can an insurance company threaten the financial system? Uh, we don't even think it is a, uh, as a financial, financial institution, but it indeed was. Uh, and so the fact that the government was slow there was a disaster. They finally got it right. They took another two weeks, but by that time the damage had been done. So the government also learned that, uh, that uh, waiting was a disaster. So then you get to, to, uh, to March, and miraculously, I, I can't tell you how depressed I am about the partisanship in Congress. Uh, when I look at the political situation, uh, I don't want to talk about it because I'll start, start to cry, I get so upset about it. Uh, but what was remarkable was that these two feuding guys, this is like uh, 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 the, uh, you know, Russia and the United States saying, let's, let's put all our differences aside and actually work together to solve a problem. It was extraordinary. And they passed a $2 trillion bill. 
which put, put a lot of money into the economy. This again is absolutely extraordinary. Why did it happen? Because they realized if we, if we learned our lesson, we were slow. If we screw this up, we're all out of office. It's a disaster. The country's going down the tubes. So that's why I say that, that, uh, that if you really think of the bottom line from all of, the, of this is how lucky we were that this occurred after the financial crisis and not before. If this pandemic had occurred before, it would have been a disaster. I would also argue that we're also lucky in terms of technology. Uh, think about uh, uh, 2006 or something like happened. We didn't have Zoom then, what you're all watching on right now. If uh, uh, we have a tremendous number of jobs that people can still do, including mine. I taught the last half of my semester completely with Zoom. I've talked to uh, 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 people who are in, in the business of information. I have a friend of mine who's an investment banker, and he said, I'm never going, you know, I'm not going back in there to, to work. I'm more productive this way. Uh, so actually, even though the job loss was huge in sectors which couldn't use technology, we are very lucky because the unemployment rate and the disaster would have been much worse. And furthermore, uh, just think about the fact if you didn't have Amazon uh, and a, a fresh direct and all this able to build, ability to deliver, uh, uh, again, I can't tell you how much worse the economy would be. So uh, here's the good news. The good news is this is a hell of a lot less bad than, than it could have been. And we're, hell, we're incredibly lucky that this didn't happen 20 years ago and that it happened now. So let me turn it over to, to Trish. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you, Rick, um, uh, for the for the good news part of this. I guess maybe I'm supposed to deliver the bad news, although I, I think I probably have much more of a mixed bag than that uh, here. But I do want to start where uh, reemphasize Rick's main point, which is that what the Fed and the government, for that matter, but the Fed has has done is just extraordinary. Uh, they set up more programs in six weeks than in the entire financial crisis, and indeed. <laughs> They announced more programs in eight days than they did in 14 months um, 12 years ago. So really, really a, a huge difference. In, in addition to the learning, which I agree with, that's also, I think, a reflection of the nature of this crisis, which is very, very, very different. The crisis 12 years ago started in the financial system and dragged the real economy down with it. Here, the public health restrictions required to handle the pandemic basically caused the real economy to just step off a cliff. I mean, a cliff, if you look at charts of economic activity. A huge supply and demand shock, um, a collapse in the real economy, but actually a financial system that was quite strong going in, partly because of all the reforms that were made after the financial crisis 12 years ago. Um, I, let, me, let me turn to what the Fed has done. And I, because I, there's so many programs, it looks like alphabet soup. So let me, let me start by breaking these down into three categories uh, of things that the Fed has done since the middle of March. The first of those are changes to monetary policy, setting interest rates to zero immediately and immediately launching large asset purchase programs. In fact, asset purchase programs that were large to begin with when there was market turmoil a few days into this crisis, they vastly expanded the pace at which they were purchasing assets to the point that at one point they bought more assets in a week than they had bought, um, or I think in 10 days, than they had bought through all of QE1 and QE2. I mean, just an extraordinary uh, uh, level of, of, of asset purchases, basically to stabilize financial markets. Because when the real economy is collapsing and you have a strong financial system, the last thing you want to do is create a financial crisis or let one get going if there's not a need for it. Um, and so as a result of this, of course, the Fed's balance sheet has exploded. Uh, it's gone from $4 trillion to $7 trillion in the space of a few months. Two and a half trillion of that is literally asset purchases. So what's the rest? And I, despite the fact this is a small part, I'm going to spend most of my time uh, talking about that other that other 500 billion um, because those are all the other programs um, that they have that they have introduced. Um, so monetary policy was was one set of programs. The other two set of programs. One is liquidity programs, if you like, classic lender of last resort to the financial system. And now I'm going to break out a third category which is what I call targeted credit programs. And these are the credit programs that the Fed has introduced that are actually about lending directly to the non-financial sector, to the real economy, to non-financial companies, uh, to uh, state and local governments, and, and at least indirectly 
to households as well. Um, so let me talk about classic lender of last resort. So lending within the financial system. Um, and those are the facilities that where the Fed took out the rule book from 12 years ago and just reinstituted virtually all of the programs. Um, and they did it very quickly and they got them up and running in a couple of weeks. And at the beginning, they were very necessary. Um, but actually their usage, with one notable exception, their usage has actually been pretty small, small compared to uh, the asset purchases, but small compared to what they did, what happened 12 years ago too. And of course, the main reason for that is the financial system was actually in pretty good shape walking into this crisis. Um, of course, the big concern, and I'm going to talk about risks at the end, the big concern here is the financial system isn't going to stay that way the longer that the pandemics uh, and the real economic weakness continues. One note, when I said there's one exception to the programs being small, the liquidity programs, I want to note that the one exception to that is actually the swap lines between the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world. So if you like the international provision of dollars, um, it's sort, sort of gotten to be a, a, a meta theorem that um, U.S. dollar liquidity uh, shortages are always much worse outside the United States than they are inside the United States, um, and that's the case this time. Though that lending was $450 billion for a while. It's now down, but it too has fallen off in the last few weeks, but that by far is the largest liquidity facility. The other liquidity facilities for commercial paper, for uh, money market funds, for the discount, the traditional discount window lending, for primary dealers are relatively small amounts. They are being used, but they're pretty small. Um, but where there is, I think, bo both a huge amount of interest and more uncertainty is with these targeted credit programs. Given the nature of this crisis, what the real economy has needed is, if you like, a bridge to the other side. You can think of this as bridge financing. And that's what the targeted credit lending programs that the Federal Reserve um, has announced are for. They are uh, targeted lending to firms of a wide variety of sizes, big, medium, and small, to state and local governments, and at least indirectly to households. And they are incredibly important. And in that regard, they are, they are uh, analogous in many ways to the fiscal policy programs unemployment insurance, the PPP program, additional support, direct support for state and local governments and hospitals and so forth that Congress passed. Those are cushion the blow policies and that is indeed largely what these targeted credit programs are as well. Of course, the other reason to, that I am sort of separating these programs out a little bit from the rest is because the Fed's targeted lending programs are really only possible because the Congress provided the Fed's programs with a very large fiscal backstop, as much as $450 billion, if you like, in first loss protection. Uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, by statute, can't take that much risk. Uh, and so effectively, Congress is allocating them funds to allow them to take more. Um, now, the Fed's new programs um, span a wide variety uh, within the business world, the corporate credit facilities are aimed at the very largest firms. Those are both primary and secondary corporate market bond purchases, a municipal bond program, and three uh, Main Street facilities, uh, as they're labeled, for small and middle market firms of various sizes. Um, and last and certainly not least, of course, is the TELF program. That is the one program that was used during the financial crisis. That's an asset-backed securities liquidity facility. Um, and it's particularly focused on supporting securitizations. And I think it's important to note, particularly of household credit. So that's when I say indirectly assisting households, uh, that's the program that's doing that. I think what's really important, and now I'm gonna harken back to something Rick said a few minutes ago, what's really important is that those programs were announced in March, but they have barely started. Only two of them are up and running. The other two are still, I think, on the final stages of the drawing board, but are still on the drawing board. And why? They're incredibly complicated. The Fed has asked for a lot of public comment. There's a lot of learning by doing here, and hopefully learning before they do as well. Basically, all of them except the TELF program, the Asset-Backed Securities program, had to be created completely from scratch. 
The Fed has never done anything like this. And the fact they've done it in two months instead of 14 months, uh, I think is a testament to the fact that they have leveraged what they learned 12 years ago, as Rick noted, but there's absolutely still a lot of technical details that have to be worked out. So these credit programs, which seem pretty important, are really not, are barely up and running, uh, only half of them, in fact. But on the good news front, just the announcement of these programs and a partial implementation had a huge financial market and financial system confidence effects. That, that has mattered to an incredible degree in the last two months, uh, three months. It matters because it means that the non-financial uh, firms and households and municipalities have been able to continue to borrow from the private sector before these backstop facilities are even implemented. Uh, and one of the reasons that was possible is because just their announcement brought down credit spreads and encouraged lenders to lend because they knew that a backstop was going to be coming um, for this sort of lending. The confidence effects, if you liked, allowed financial markets to kind of look beyond the cliff, uh, at least of these first few months. And that's important because of the time it's taken to get things up and running. Uh, so let me uh, stop there. We can certainly talk more about some of the facilities in detail if people have questions. Um, but I want to mention a couple of risks before I finish. Um, there are a lot of risks ahead here, a lot. The biggest near-term risk, uh, frankly, is that these policies, particularly the targeted uh, credit policies, don't actually work. Or they don't work as well as the Fed may have envisioned. And Based on past experience, there's a chance that some of them will not work quite the way they were designed to work, and the, they may have to be tweaked. They've already been tweaked a bit, they'll probably be tweaked again. If that happens, and if the confidence the effects we've had before don't last, then the decline in credit could really cause um, further job destruction, further loss of firms, and make the medium-term economic outlook look worse. So that's a downside risk, I think, of things just not working. And of course, that could happen in a couple of, in a couple of ways. One way, of course, is the programs are too, too slow uh, um, uh, to get going. Although, frankly, given the complexity, uh, they've been stood up pretty fast, all things considered. A second reason, though, that, that this could happen is the government deci decides it doesn't want to take very much risk. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the targeted credit lending facilities of the Fed are cooperative ventures. They are quasi-fiscal, if you like. They are ventures, a, a coordination between the Fed and the U.S. Treasury. But the risk appetite of those facilities is largely structured by the U.S. Treasury. The Fed's capacity to take risk is extremely limited. It's written in the statute. They simply can't do it. That's why they have to have capital like this backstopping losses. Uh, and so the question becomes, to what degree will Treasury and the government be willing to take losses on that $450 billion uh, in, in, in equity, if you like, that they're providing to the Fed? And if, that, if they decide they're not going to do that and the terms are too conservative, it may be that very few firms in the current economic environment will actually qualify. Third, and I think this is, this is related to the point I just made, there are a number of recent criticisms um, uh, for which I have some sympathy, frankly, that the programs like the Main Street facility are pretty expensive. They're quite restrictive in some, in some ways. And perhaps most importantly for the Main Street facilities, they're very complicated, uh, more complicated than many small and medium-sized firms may be able to, to, to handle in order just to fill out the paperwork. Um, now, these are complicated lending programs, so it's, you're not too surprised that all loans are complicated, but these are particularly when you have two different parts of the government involved. Um, but that's a risk for certain. So last and certainly not least in terms of near-term risks, of course, is uh, we, as we are learning day to day, this virus is incredibly persistent. And, it, and if there are additional large-scale lockdowns or just rolling ones, um, then the idea of a fast recovery seems pretty remote um, and probably something more U-shaped um, uh, is much more likely here. Um, but that's a long time. 
for confidence effects and for financial markets to uh, be patient and uh, have the ability to withstand. Um, I, I'm going to quote a former colleague of mine uh, that firms and households and financial markets respond to policy expectations and to confidence effects in the way they behave, at least for a while. Viruses do not. And if the virus and the public health measures with respect to it are the things that are going to drive things in the medium term, then the rest of the economic policy is, I'm afraid, going to be very much in reactive mode in response to that. Um, there's a final risk that I'll be interested to hear Rick's view on, so I'm going to bring it up because he didn't. Uh, and that is about um, the very long-term risks to uh, Federal Reserve independence. And I think that's a risk both due to these, the quasi-fiscal nature of these targeted lending programs um, to corporations, particularly to municipalities, um, but also, frankly, the ultimate size of the Fed's balance sheet. If this is a slow recovery and QE goes on a long time, the Fed's balance sheet is going to be enormous. Um, and it's going to hold enormous amounts of government debt. Uh, that definitely raises several longer term political risks and economic risks for the Fed, which we can tackle in the Q&A. Um, uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Trish. Um, so I, I want to start with a question about uh, that I, I don't think either of you touched on too much. Um, can, can I come in and one or two? Oh, to, please. To, yeah. to expand on uh, uh, what Trish is saying, not the big issue, which we need to time to. But one of the things that's very important to recognize is the fact that facilities aren't used very much may be a sign of their success, uh, not that there's something wrong. So. And uh, Trish used this phrase, lend of last resort. This is a classic uh, central banking uh, role. Uh, the central banks have this uh, uh, magic ability. They're the only entity in the society that can create money out of nowhere. And so everybody else has the problem. The Fed wants to create $20 trillion. Boy, they can do it. And they can actually do it almost instantaneously. Uh, and that's what we, why we call lender of last resort. Uh, that, uh, uh, if you have facilities, and then I would argue that, that uh, uh, the facilities that, that were focused on the financial system, uh, that the fact that most of them didn't need to be used, except the swaps, is, doesn't mean that they weren't absolutely critical. Indeed, they were. I'm sure Chris is going to agree with me on this. Yes. Uh, that um, Because the faster you do your lender of last resort, that once people know that there's a backstop, they won't need the money. So let me just give you a quick example, uh, which people uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from economic history no, it's recent, which is what happened during the October 1987 uh, uh, stock market crash. So uh, it turns out that uh, there was a seizing up of the financial markets. The market crashed. I don't remember the exact date, whatever it was like in October. Uh, it crashed. And then it turns out that the, that the people who were doing all the clearing for the markets, and particularly in terms of margin accounts, uh, basically needed to borrow to keep the system functioning. And these were guys like uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, which, you know, they're richer than God. So why would they ever need the money? But it turns out when the sky is falling in, uh, even Goldman Sachs couldn't get, couldn't borrow. So uh, uh, they and Kidder Peabody in particular were the ones uh, who were backstopping a lot of these accounts, uh, uh, communicated with the Fed that they had a big problem. Uh, what happened was that Alan Greenspan, you know, this apocryphal story about Alan Greenspan is that every morning he sits for an hour in the tub and thinks about, uh, looks at the data, and then figures out what's going on. My image of him is that he's actually sacrificing a goat and feeling the entrails to figure out what was going on because he's such a master forecaster. But he didn't go get, take his bath that morning. Instead, he got up before the markets opened up, said the Fed is going to stand ready to lend whatever people need. Uh, and what was remarkable about it is this instance was that nobody came to the Fed to borrow because just indicating that, uh, uh, that you had this backstop was enough. And I, I would argue that exactly the same thing uh, 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 is what's happened here, which is uh, foreign governments needed the dollar liquidity. That's always because there's a flight to quality where people want dollars. Uh, but otherwise, the announcement of all these programs and the fact that they worked during the previous crisis, everybody said, we don't need to worry about it. So I just wanted to add that because I think it's a, a, a point that's really critical. It might be misunderstood. In fact, frequently when you do the right thing, if you do the right thing, uh, then, not, then you didn't need to, then it, nothing happens. But it turns out that uh, if you didn't do the right thing, it's a disaster. Uh, and people don't frequently get that. And so I wanted to just add that to, uh, 
to Trisha's comments, I know she's going to agree with me on it. So, uh, uh, but I think it, you, you don't want people confused and said, oh, they weren't used. Why the hell did they have to bother? The answer is these programs were incredibly important. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Rick. I was actually, I was going to ask a different question, but since you brought this up, this was also on my list and, and I'd be curious to hear, it sounds like you've, you've given us some sense of where you stand, but for both of you, you know, what, what is the best way to judge the success of these programs? Um, and, and, you know, obviously some of them, as Trish um, pointed out, you know, they're still getting going. It's very early. Some of them aren't, haven't launched at all. Um, so it's probably early, but when we're looking back, I mean, how, um, you know, for a, for a lay person, how, how, how should we be thinking about that question, whether they worked or, or whether they were effective? So I'll offer my two cents in worth. Uh, um, I, first of all, I, I, I agree with Rick. One of the things about this is that most lending facilities in the Federal Reserve are not intended to be the primary first. That's why it's lender of last resort, not lender of first resort. Um, and that's true of the credit programs by the, these new ones as well, uh, or at least some of the new ones. But the point is that if their existence means that the private sector continues to lend, and, there have, and, and those, particularly in the real economy right now, who need to borrow at reasonable rates, so not at astronomical rates, but at reasonable rates, if those two things happen, then they're a success just by being there. And one of the things that was fascinating about what happened in March is, March is there was this kind of wild, crazy market dysfunction, even in the treasury market, but certainly in credit markets. Huge explosion in spreads sort of across the board, lots and lots of different markets. Um, uh, disaster inequities, et cetera. These facilities go in. There is some borrowing, nothing like the financial crisis in 2008, but almost instantaneously, the spreads start to come back in in those markets. Just the, the municipal bond market facility was announced. It wasn't, they didn't start buying any municipal bonds until two weeks ago, but municipal bond spreads went almost to, back to normal and, if, and have largely stayed there. So honestly, it's possible they won't end up buying very many municipal bonds because they're probably kind of expensive. And if private investors want them, why should the Federal Reserve be in there buying in very large quantities? So I'll give you an example from both the traditional lender of last resort and from a credit facility standpoint. So that's one reason I think that for the corporate bonds and the municipal facility, which are up and running of these new credit programs, the, they're not purchasing an enormous amounts of debt. And I don't expect them to. For as long as the private sector the financial system can lend and make credit to the real economy, the Federal Reserve should be sitting there in the background in a backstop in this situation. Uh, they're there and these programs need to be functional and need to work in the sense of if things go south, they are there when the private sector can't handle it. Thanks for that. Um, oh, go ahead, Rick, did you wanna follow up? Yeah, I actually, I, could you share a screen from, from me? Can you do that? If not, if it's too technically complicated, don't do it. But, but I want to strongly agree with, uh, uh, with Trish on this. And I just want to show one picture I think that illustrates it. You, is it possible to share my screen? If it's too technically complicated, don't worry about it. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to try to share it. I don't know if that's sharing it or not. Let me do this. Did that share it? It did? Good. Okay, so take a look at this. Uh, th there's an issue about what happens to the overall economy, but the question is what's happening in the financial sector. Uh, and, uh, and credit spreads, uh, again, this is something that I started doing research on in 1990, uh, but credit spreads are uh, a very key indicator of whether the financial system is doing its job properly. So if you think about how important the financial system is, the financial system, if you think about it, it's like the brain of the economy, it coordinates. It allows people to get uh, money who have excess savings to get it to people with productive investments. And if you do that well, your economy works well. Uh, that's actually uh, 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 during normal times. If all of a sudden that stops happening, that's a financial crisis. That's when you get into big trouble. If it permanently doesn't happen, by the way, that's why you're a poor country. And so, uh, so it also is, is very important in terms of why some countries do well and why some countries don't. So if you look at this picture, this is one of the uh, important credit spreads called uh, the TED spread. It's, it's, a interbank, uh, it's the interbank rate minus uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the treasury, treasury bill rate. Uh, and you can see that uh, during the financial crisis, I'm sort of, that's in here, 
that this credit spread actually shot up to extremely high levels. It's, it started to shoot up actually with the uh, uh, BNP Paribas. Uh, there's Bear Stearns. And of course, uh, uh, when it really goes to disaster is when you get to Lehman Brothers. That's the, uh, uh, the peak, which is huge. But on the other hand, if you go to this other period down in here, what you can see is that uh, the credit spread, which now is at a very normal, good low levels, uh, shoots up again in March, uh, but then comes back down to levels that we saw before the, before the uh, crisis started. So what this is saying is that uh, from a point of view of the financial sector, still able to do its job, it, 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 all these uh, uh, measures work. And so that's why, uh, if we think about instead going into a period like what happened in, in after Lehman Brothers, then in fact, uh, the world's going to collapse. And by the way, it would have been worse because it wasn't just the financial sector that was causing the problem. It was the goddamn virus that was causing the problem. So th this is a real shock that, uh, that is huge, uh, and it would have made things uh, that much worse. So uh, to reiterate uh, 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 Trisha's point, which is that uh, did this work? Absolutely it worked. Can it solve all the problems? No, because there are real effects going on here. And in fact, if we don't get the coronavirus under control, we don't get a vaccine, uh, the, uh, uh, what I consider to be inappropriate, the fact that, that people aren't wearing masks in the United States, that we, that we have no leadership from, from, from the president who basically says, I don't like him, and then you watch at, uh, his rallies and nobody's wearing a mask and it's like a super spreading event. Uh, that can kill us. But the bottom line is it's not the financial sector that will do it. Uh, and at least that's a benefit, but we still have a long way to go to getting this crisis under control. Uh, but I, I, I will tell you, I think that the Fed is, uh, is uh, uh, done a great job in this context. And it's amazing how quickly, and you can see that we didn't get the spike in terms of credit spreads that we got in the last crisis. And in fact, it came down in, in less than a month. That's an indication of how, how, uh, how uh, successful this was. So Rick, you know, it seems as though or both of you are saying and agreeing that the message has been received by financial markets, but I'm curious to hear what you think about how the job that Fed officials and, uh, and Jay Powell in particular have done communicating with the public about these programs. Um, and, and, you know, there was a lot of criticism after the last crisis about, you know, on that, on that front, on that issue, these were new policies, they're unconventional, you know, a number of those, as you said, have, have been brought back. But what about these new ones? Um, how do you think, how would you judge their, uh, the job that they're doing on the communications front? Yeah, so uh, my view on this is that uh, the Fed actually, uh, uh, there's some huge, huge dangers to this. And I'm going to be, uh, I was very critical uh, previously of Jay's communication about monetary policy. I think Jay actually is doing a very good job in the actual actions of the Fed. Uh, I think the communication has been very weak. Uh, Wall Street has been very unhappy with it as well. And I think there's a huge communications uh, uh, issue facing Jay. Hey, um, Rick, Rick, I'm sorry. Can I jump in for one sec? Would you mind yeah. just uh, unsharing your screen so that yeah, everyone can do that? I, mine says share. And Maybe I don't press it again, I think. It says new share on mine now. There you are. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Whatever I did, I just clicked something and something worked. That, that's perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. So, uh, so here's the issue. Uh, and, and actually, this is a very important part of, of something else I wanted to bring up, which is uh, uh, Trish mentioned that this crisis is very different. There's another sense that makes it very different, which is also one of the reasons why both the Congress and also the Fed can act as quickly. And this has to do with what we refer to as moral hazard. So one of the big problems when you create uh, 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 lending facilities is that as a backstop, you're basically saying, well, you can't say this anymore because it's not politically correct, but you know, I can you talk about the cavalry coming to the rescue. Now we'd say the cavalry is coming to murder people, but, but, uh, but the idea that somebody is actually coming to the rescue, if you know they're going to come to the rescue, you can take big risks. And particularly, this was a big issue in terms of uh, for the Federal Reserve uh, before the crisis is something called the Greenspan put uh, that, uh, that actually I think uh, uh, was quite important. Uh, if you know that people are gonna eventually backstop you uh, and bail you out, you're actually not gonna do what you need to do. And a classic case of this, by the way, which actually created the, uh, helped create the disaster crisis is what happened with Dick Fold, who was the head of Lehman Brothers. Uh, everybody in Wall Street knew that Lehman Brothers was next if something happened. It was sort of the dirty little secret of Wall Street. Uh, and both the Federal Reserve and Hank Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary at the time, went to Dick Fold 
and said to Dick, Dick, you got to raise capital. You're, you're, you're taking more risk. Everybody knows it. Uh, you're, you're very involved in, in mortgage-backed securities. You got to go out and raise capital to give you more of a cushion. And Dick Fold said, you know what? Screw you. It will just dilute my shareholders. It will cost me money. I don't need to do, do it because guess what? You let me go, see what happens. You're going to bail me out. Well, they called Dick Fold's bluff and guess what? It was a disaster. But in fact, that the, uh, the disastrous part of the financial crisis could have been avoided. Uh, it's actually, Warren Buffett talked about potentially giving you money to, to, uh, to, to, uh, 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 to raise capital for, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for Lehman Brothers. So it's, it's, it's moral hazard problems, a huge issue when you do this kind of lending. The wonderful thing about this crisis is it's an act of God. This is not an issue of moral hazard. It's not that people did bad things, uh, took risks, and then caused a problem, as we saw actually happen during the financial crisis. This is something that, you know, uh, not the good day of six machina, but the bad day of six machina, that something really bad is coming that, that uh, you couldn't predict, uh, uh, or, you know, you certainly could predict the timing, uh, and uh, it's a natural disaster. So this is like the, the tsunami hitting uh, Fukushima. Uh, 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 when you, you, you have an area that has, uh, uh, when you have Katrina or Sandy, uh, and in fact, in this case, you don't worry about moral hazard as much. So one of the problems, in fact, there was a big fight about this, but uh, all through the process of the uh, financial crisis, you have to remember that there was huge criticism of Ben Bernanke. Uh, maybe you don't remember this, but at one point, the governor of Texas said to Ben Bernanke, if you come to Texas, we're going to rough you up. I mean, this is how extreme it was. And so, uh, and the reason was they said you bailed out everybody uh, and you bailed out Wall Street. And that actually constrains you a tremendous amount. And by the way, it's part of the reasons why programs are complicated. Trish was mentioning this in terms of some of these programs. Part of the complication is you don't want to create moral hazard. So what was different about this is that this is an act of God. Uh, and so then you don't have to, uh, in, in fact, the criticism of the Fed of, of, of a moral hazard. Actually, people said the Fed shouldn't have done what it did. Uh, I think they were dead wrong because my view of this is it's, it's the way you think about fire departments. When there's a fire, you don't discuss whether, in fact, you had good regulation beforehand and whether there were good fire sprinklers. You put out the goddamn fire. Then another role of the fire department is to say you have fire codes and you better do prevention. So I actually think that in this case, once the fire started, you put it out, and that's what the Fed did. But the criticism of this uh, means that people will take time. And that was part of the reason why the TARP was originally voted down. This case, it was an act of God. It's not like there's moral hazard. And in fact, in that case, you don't have to worry about it. You can act much quicker. So this is also one of the reasons that Trish pointed out, this really is a very different kind of crisis. Now, the problem here is that the debt has now gone into territory it never wants to get into. It is now involved in fiscal actions, uh, 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 at the behest of the Treasury, by the way. So Trish is absolutely right that the Treasury's backstop this. Uh, but uh, for the facilities that didn't involve uh, these private loans, the Fed didn't need the Treasury. That it knows how to do that. It didn't have a backstop. But the $454 billion in the CARE Act is actually uh, the backstop that the Fed needs because it can't take uh, uh, this kind of risk according to its statute. So when you think about this and think about how uh, uh, the, uh, the Fed is operating, uh, the problem is, that has occurred is that the Fed now has gone into territory it's never gone before. And they're going to be called on to do it again. What Jay has not done and needs to do very, very clearly is to say, look, that uh, this is very different than the financial crisis. This is a case where the moral hazard issues were not relevant in terms of what we need to do. In fact, really talking about it even now, uh, because he's talked about the fact that the Fed needs to do more, and I think he's, he's right on that, uh, that this is something that's very different. But he's got to say that, in fact, the Fed should not do this again unless there's an act of God uh, like this. The way to think about this is it's disaster relief. And uh, uh, we've never had something like this uh, happen before. He has to make it very clear that this is, that doing this kind of, of, of lending, which has this kind of risk and is quasi-fiscal, is not something the Fed should do in the future unless it's an act of God incident similar to what we've had here. He's not done that. It's extremely important for him to do that because otherwise the Fed is going to be compromised. It already is compromised. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, there's still compromise even what it did during the global financial crisis. You shouldn't do that lightly. Uh, you basically need to know that things have really gotten bad before you do it. But on the other hand, uh, uh, 
uh, there at least it was not quasi-fiscal in the same way it is now. The criticism during the global financial crisis were intense about the Fed. I think more misguided then. If the Fed, this happens, you know the Congress is gonna want the Fed to bail out businesses again if something goes on, because it, it's already crossed the Rubicon in, that, in, in this instance. Jay has to spend some time now before that happens and say, by the way, this is very different. Now, he hasn't done that at all. I think it's an issue that he has to start bringing up. You know, it's more sophisticated. So uh, this is speeches and saying why it's correct for us to do what we're doing now and keep doing it, which is one of the things he said, but why we should not do this if in fact uh, uh, this is something that, that arose in the financial sector or in the economy that had nothing to do with, the, with basically God smiting us with lightning. And he hasn't done that. It's extremely important. Do you so, want to jump in, Trish? Yeah, Sorry. so I want, I want to add a couple of points that are, are related to Rick's. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with him on the moral hazard point. Um, and in fact, one of the mitigants to moral hazard um, is typically that uh, lending facilities, traditional lending facilities to the financial system that central banks set up, including the feds, are set at a penalty rate, meaning a rate that's high in normal times, but is uh, looks pretty attractive when the world is crazy. And, and and uh, credit and markets are very tight. Um, interestingly enough, partly because of the recognition of the, less, uh, the lower moral hazard in this particular case, the penalty rates for most of the Fed facilities are actually lower this time than they were in the financial crisis. And that's partly the financial system is healthy. These are really uh, backstops. They don't have to be, there's less moral hazard and so forth. Um, but I think if the Fed is going to, I'll give you a microcosm case, the lending facilities for the Main Street uh, facilities, however, uh, look a lot more like not high penalty rates or, or uh, particularly, but definitely are higher. And indeed, there's been some recent criticism about how high the interest rates on those loans are going to be and whether they'll end up being, being attractive or not. Um, and I do wonder, I, the Fed has not talked about this very much, but I think uh, like Rick, it would be worth spending some time talking about why, in broad terms, the facilities are structured the way they are, and is it, are they worried about risk? Are they worried about moral hazard? Um, I think that would clarify things a lot. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get the politicians yelling at you about something, because you probably will, but, but my, my point here is that the um, being clear about what the driving considerations are, um, I, I think, for the, different, for the different types of facilities um, could be quite helpful. Um, it is pretty clear that all of them, though, have had very positive effects so far, um, even the ones that are not being used that, that much. And again, that's also a reflection of the moral, of the, uh, in part of the, along with moral hazard goes stigma. Uh, and um, on, the, on the flip side of this, and, and interestingly enough, these facilities so far have not been particularly stigmatized. Um, we'll see if that continues. History tells us that stigma tends to show up when you least want it uh, to, but, um, but it could. Thank you, Trish. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about this Fed Treasury collaboration. Um, and, and kind of some of the risks there. Uh, you know, there's, there's several different ones. We talked about the independence of the Fed, but Trish, you also mentioned um, it in the context of the risk appetite and how it really is up to, kind of up to the Treasury. They're the ones uh, that Congress authorized to, to um, take these first losses. Uh, how do you how do you see this collaboration working out so far? And I guess through through the lens of you know how how the programs are structured, as you said, it would be nice to know a little bit more about why the decisions were made the way they were. But uh, you know, as you look at them, what's your sense of of the appetite there, if you will? We've heard we've heard from the Treasury Secretary first. He said, "Well, we don't want to take losses." Then he said, "Well, wait a minute, we are prepared to take them." There was complaints from Congress. So, what do you what do you think? Are they calibrated the right way? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. And I, I you know, the bottom line is I don't know if they're calibrated correctly or not. Um, uh, I it is interesting that uh, the Treasury Secretary seems very concerned about taking any kind of sizable losses. And let me focus here on the Main Street facilities because this is small and middle market business lending. Uh, and which is done by both banks and non-banks. Um, uh, and um, that's, that's like, it's a 
perfectly profitable business in banking. It's a traditional banking activity, but it's risky. Some of these folks fail um, and you end up, you know, you make money on the ones that survive and, and, and um, hopefully uh, write your loan contract sensibly so that you can mitigate some of the losses on the ones that don't make it. That's going to happen here if this, these, if, and this is the if, if these programs get to any size. And those are going to be the losses that the, that the Treasury Department faces on the equity. Um, and so that's where I don't have a very clear sense, particularly given um, these are so the 450 plus billion dollars is appropriated, which means it's considered expenditure by Congress. So, which I assume is one of the reasons that at least some members of Congress have been somewhat critical of what's going on. Um, I, it's not the Fed's place. Let me be clear here to tell Treasury how much risk to take, uh, and that is the line where the cooperation ends uh, is my best guess based on both what I know about how the Fed works and what I know about Jay Powell. So um, I don't think you're going to get this from the Fed side. If there's going to be clarity on this issue, um, maybe, the, maybe the calculations and, the, and the, 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 the analytics behind it may be done by the Fed and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the point about where is our, you know, at what point are we going to set our expected losses? Not unexpected losses, but our expected losses, given what we know about this type of loan. Um, it's clearly not zero anymore from what the Treasury Secretary said, but it would actually be helpful to get a vague sense of where it is. You have a rough sense by how much they're willing to leverage. So the fact that the different facilities have, there's a different amount of lending that the, is a, of the leverage. Now the leverage has to be a joint decision of both the treasury and the Fed because it's the Fed making the loans, but it's treasury with the first loss. Um, so that's the one place where there is some information. And it's pretty clear that, for example, um, high yield ETFs, which are part of the secondary market at corporate credit facility, um, are not a very attractive uh, investment uh, because they're only levering them three to one, whereas they're willing to leverage middle market lending uh, eight to 10 to one. So um, uh, it seems pretty clear that if they have a preference for where they take their losses, it's gonna be on the Main Street facilities and not there. But other than that comparison, it's, I don't think anybody sort of outside of the institutions really knows the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a related, uh, you know, audience question that I think is really interesting. So um, this is from Chris Doyle. He says, could you discuss the cost of these programs in the context of lack of compliance with public health directives in some regions? So the Fed can't control the virus, but the government and public policy can impact the size and duration of this. So it seems that the lack of compliance in some regions could increase the cost of the programs you're describing beyond their cost in the context of a cooperative society. Um, that's kind of interesting. What do you guys think? I think that there's no question about this. That, that uh, uh, the bottom line is at this stage, uh, the economic costs are going to be very driven by what happens in terms of the pandemic. And what is so uh, uh, depressing and to me uh, um, unfortunate is that we have lessons from countries which have been able to contain this. And a couple of simple things uh, do this. It turns out what's really critical in terms of containing the virus is uh, uh, not uh, lowering everybody's uh, um, uh, reproduction rate uh, by the same percentage. It's getting rid of super spreaders. Uh, and what you see is that uh, one of the reasons uh, Asian countries have done much better is because everybody, they're used to wearing masks. They, you know, I have to tell you, that at the very, before the crisis really hit, I was at the business school, I was still teaching there, and I saw these Asians wearing masks and I said to myself, how silly. <laughs> so, so I now realize, and, and the reason is, of course, is it doesn't really protect you, but of course, it's the externality, the fact that, uh, that you're affecting other people. Uh, so it's a few simple things. One is, uh, the, uh, there's a couple of things that we know are super dangerous uh, that does uh, bars, indoor bars. You go inside, the virus spreads and not wearing masks. And the fact that you're drunk and yelling and screaming doesn't help either. So these are super spreader events. It was remarkable to me that all these states opened up their bars. Uh, there was a lot of lobbying by the bars, by the way, but this is actually to be criminal actions. 
that uh, 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 the other issue is just in general wearing masks. Uh, uh, and, and this has now become a politi politicized. It's remarkable that now there's this thing that's red states versus blue states and whether you wear a mask. I am not worried. I'm in New York. And I, basically everybody, you know, if you're outside, not near anybody, you don't wear a mask. But people all wear masks. And it's basically saying, I care about other people. It's not about whether I'm Democratic or Republican. For some reason, although I think, to be honest, the president hasn't helped because he's made this mass thing, like, you know, uh, sort of that this a little bit, that is this a hoax and real men don't wear masks, uh, that, that uh, you see this as supporters don't wear masks. Uh, this is basically uh, something that is so low cost to prevent the spread. So basically bars, masks, the one that's very complicated is churches because it turns out the churches are also super spreader events. Uh, it turns out being close, close to each other, and singing uh, or, or yelling is super spreading. So if you just did this three, th those three things, it's very probable without any other lockdowns, uh, you know, that you, uh, uh, you could basically contain this and be okay, and we can reopen the economy. But that's not what's happening. So I think that the, the thing that scares the hell out of me is we're now getting a, a flare up in a lot of places, not in the Northeast, where people basically have, you know, uh, have actually, uh, uh, Barack Cuomo has been very good on this. I'd say he did a great job in some other ways, but Barack Cuomo said, we're in this together. It's about caring about other people that you wear a mask. So uh, the problem is that if things are, uh, I think are gonna be much worse than I otherwise expected, because what looked like it was being contained is now seeming to flare up. Now, maybe get back under control. Even uh, the governor of Texas now just uh, stopped all, all bars. So good for him on this one. Uh, and, uh, and that clearly, uh, 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 is a Republican red state. So uh, if we get more of that, maybe we'll contain this. It's sure, you know, our, our, uh, the attitude of a president in providing leadership, uh, the reason for wearing a mask is not basically a big deal in terms of protecting other people and so forth. He's right, he gets tested and everything else. It's basically saying it's normal, it's, you know, it's manly to wear a mask. Uh, uh, this is, is, is if you care about your fellow, uh, your fellow man. So the problem is right now, where we are in this crisis is it's driven by a real factor, which is how bad the pandemic is going to get. If this is now getting out of control, uh, 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 what was looking more like a V-shaped, uh, you know, not V-shaped and then get back super quickly, but pretty V-shaped, very, very fast recovery. It looked like that was happening. Uh, that won't happen. And now we have really big problems. I would say then it's still true that you do want to do the lending. Uh, because you want to protect people. So in that case, there are going to be losses and there should be losses. It's a fiscal, this is a fiscal policy. Just as you spend, send people $1,200 checks, uh, uh, backing up, making sure the businesses uh, can reopen when things get back to normal is also important. So the bottom line is right now, uh, I'm not worried about the policy from, uh, from uh, uh, the Fed. I think the government will do more expansion policy if it needs to. Uh, the real problem issue right now is public health, and and we have not been doing a good job. And the Europeans have said it. They said, "Oh, we'll let you in. You're Canadian because you're 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 smart people. Americans, well, you you you're not allowed it, uh, into Europe because you're idiots. Well, let's stop being idiots. And then, in fact, uh, uh, I think things will get better. So uh, I don't know. It's all tied up with you know uh, these ideas of uh, you know freedom means you can do whatever you want. Uh, that's that's not correct. You don't have the freedom to kill other people." Uh, or uh, uh, do bad things. Uh, that's what we have laws for. Uh, we refer to this in economics as, as externalities. Uh, but that, you know, the debate's going in such weird directions uh, that it's very depressing. So one observation about this is, is that, so I agree that the local and regional public health um, uh, behavior, uh, norms, uh, requirements, uh, could definitely affect, you know, workplaces come back quicker or slower and therefore whether if the credit gets provided to firms or municipalities in those in those areas are they likely to have larger losses i guessing that's probably going to be the case but that's actually kind of generally the case for much more broadly not just in this pandemic uh that you know the united states is a huge wildly diverse uh in terms of social norms and and politics and everything else uh, country and it's always been that way. Um, so I don't think in that regard it's different. It's just 
in this particular case, it's these programs are large and the debt that's being taken on by everybody, both the federal government and the private sector is big. And so um, it seems more, con it, it well, and it is more concerning in this, uh, in this particular case. The one place where I think it will be interesting to see after the fact, and now I'm gonna sound like a researcher, uh, I'm imagining there are going to be a lot of dissertations written on this. For example, let's take PPP. So let's abstract from the Fed for a moment. Let's take the PPP program and look and see where early, uh, what happened in terms of how those loans were forgiven or not, or needed to be forgiven or not, depending on the local public health rules that during the, over the span of this crisis. That is actually like, will be ex post, a sort of empirical question to note whether that mattered. I think for the municipalities as well, if you go into lockdown um, uh, repeatedly, maybe because you opened up too soon, et cetera, um, it is the states and municipal governments that are going to end up paying the very, very biggest cost of that, uh, in addition to the local businesses, obviously, uh, uh, and, and, and households. And I think it will uh, unfortunately be pretty obvious in those places. Um, uh, if the cost is really that much higher, um, or if it's more spread out. Um, but I think it almost certainly, even at a micro level, the way I've been talking about it, I think it almost certainly has to be true. Thank you. Um, so I, well, there were a lot of conversations uh, leading up to, you know, before the pandemic, but in the past couple of years about how much firepower the Fed really had to deal with another crisis. Um, you, you ran through all of the all of the innovative programs that they managed to launch so quickly. Um, do, do they have, I mean, do, do you think that sort of these actions have proven the, the naysayers, if you will, proven them wrong, but, and, and also how, how much more, I guess, room do you think they have? Um, you know, whether they're cards, do they have up their sleeves? And um, even more specifically, you know, are there other facilities that they could launch? What, what, what could they do if this uh, proves to be a much longer um, drawn out downturn or, or recover, drawn out recovery, I guess. So uh, you want to start, Rick? Yeah, so I, I, I think the issue here, uh, let's distinguish between uh, monetary policy and credit facilities, because they're very different. Yeah. On monetary policies, uh, the Fed does not have a lot of firepower. That's, that's the reality that, uh, that uh, uh, what we call the, the, used to call the zero lower bound, that interest rate couldn't go below zero. Now we call it the effective lower bound, because you can go a smidgen below zero. Uh, is a major constraint on the ability of monetary policy to, uh, to uh, goose up the economy. And it's true, you can do these the so-called QE type programs, uh, but they're very frequently misunderstood. The issue of the QE program, uh, which in fact, uh, Ben Bernanke continually said, I hate the name. Uh, they're not quantitative easing, uh, they're credit easing. The, the point is that it's not that you're expanding high powered money, which is what they do. Uh, and, uh, and I see incredibly silly things uh, uh, said about it during the crisis, and they're getting said again. Uh, the issue here is uh, not that you're expanding the money supply, and that actually is important, because Japan uh, did this QE in major ways, but did it the wrong way. They didn't do it in terms of affecting credit markets. The key issue is that you're buying securities that actually are lowering interest rates on interest rates that are different from the federal funds rate. So that you're basically trying to lower long-term interest rates. Uh, you're, you're trying to affect credit markets so that uh, municipal bond rates are not as high, so the states can still finance things. The corporate bond rates are not as high. You're basically working on what we call credit spreads and term spreads. Uh, and that actually does have some effect, but it, it, it basically can't solve the problem of that, uh, that uh, uh, you can't lower interest rates. So is the central bank compromised in that regard? Yes. I should point out, however, people actually think the monetary policy can do a lot more than it can do that people think that there's this magic organization that can solve any problem. The answer is not. If the shock is big enough, no matter how much you do at the Fed, you can't solve the problem. And that's why the problem right now is not uh, uh, the Fed's policy. The problem is going to be public health policy. That's what the real issue is in terms of, uh, in terms of going forward. Trish might want to address the issue of credit facilities. Uh, yes, they think they can expand that, and that could be helpful. But all that can do is basically lower these spreads. If, yeah. if it turns a real shock, causes the average demand to collapse, firms, are, no matter, you, you say zero interest rates, even give you negative interest rates, and firms are not going to invest because they're not going to make any money. So yeah, that's yeah, why this, that. there is a serial yeah. limitation. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with Rick. I think that the, 
when the monetary policy is actually going to matter more, you need to keep financial conditions as easy as possible. And that's basically what monetary policy is doing in the US. Uh, and, and frankly, basically every central bank on the planet, as far as I can determine, if they can lower interest rates because they were a lot higher, they've lowered them. And those that can't have basically expanded their quote unconventional policies, buying assets and so forth and so on. Everybody's doing the same thing. That's going to be a lot more helpful when the uncertainty is around the public health end of this. Um, it makes it cheap to do the bridge financing. And it makes it cheap for the government to borrow to do expanded unemployment insurance so that people can actually keep feeding their families and paying their rent. Um, and those things keep parts of the economy still going. And that sort of standard macro multiplier is incredibly important here. But a lot of that's fiscal. Lower spreads and lower costs help because it makes it cheaper for everybody, both the private sector and the government to do it. So that's the Fed's role here. Um, but it's not, it's a little bit like, it's not exactly going to be stimulative in the true sense until the economy can really start to grow again. And that's going to be determined a lot by the public health stuff. Um, uh, so. Thank you. Let me pull up. I had one more audience question, and of course now I'm struggling with uh, with the the window here. Where did it go? Okay. Um, so so this is one from Alex. Inflation was still relatively low before this crisis compared to levels entering past economic downturns. Do you think deflation is a major risk here, and how quickly could we get there? Uh, and what are the implications given that debt levels are already high? So. I think the answer is uh, that there is a potential issue. That, that uh, it's interesting here that um, that this is both a supply shock and a demand shock, which is Trish mentioned earlier. Uh, and of course, what happens to inflation is actually which one of those is bigger? Uh, because a supply shock means you can't supply, and we see this that the chicken prices have gone up and so forth. Uh, but but in fact, I, I think the big issue here is that the supply shock from the pandemic is creating an even bigger uh, aggregate demand shock. And the demand shock actually does have the potential to uh, create deflation here. Uh, the Fed has been very successful at this, by the way. One of the great successes of the Ben Bernanke years was uh, that uh, uh, when people think about inflation targeting and having a target inflation, they always think about just not having inflation too high. What, what uh, Ben uh, pointed out, actually, this is work that Ben and I did together in a book on inflation targeting that we did many years ago, was that inflation targeting is just as important, maybe more important, to prevent deflation, that you have to have people confident that the central bank will do its job uh, and therefore uh, keep it, uh, deflation from occurring. In fact, they were successful during the global financial crisis. And uh, uh, the problem here is if the pandemic really gets much worse, so the lockdowns get much, much worse, uh, the Fed will not have the, the, uh, the ability to actually prevent the deflation from occurring. And that can be extremely damaging. So I think that the issue is, the good news is people understand the Fed uh, is committed to keeping inflation uh, uh, up. Uh, you know, they struggled a little bit during, the, during this period because inflation has been a little bit lower, but 2%, but not a disaster. Uh, in fact, there have been several instances where the Fed basically wanted to say, we're not going to be the Bank of Japan. We're not going to allow deflation to occur. And that was very important because people now expect that. The problem is if this shock gets uh, uh, much, much worse, and I'm talking a lot, lot worse than just what we're seeing now, uh, uh, and no, uh, uh, no vaccine that, that, that's, uh, that's coming in. Then, uh, then, in fact, uh, the potential for deflation is actually uh, uh, very serious. I should also point out that I do worry about potential for inflation going down the road. Uh, so, and, uh, uh, and it comes from several sources. So one thing that, that uh, people haven't talked about is that the, uh, uh, we've had a huge expansion in federal debt relative to GDP uh, even before the crisis, which I think was a, a mistake. But but uh, 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 this had to do with the nature of the tax cuts, some of which I actually supported. Uh, but tax cuts and no, uh, the only bipartisan thing in Congress is that neither party, uh, both parties want to spend a lot of money. So that occurred before the crisis. What is again very different about a disaster relief type program and why even though this has created a huge expansion in the debt to GDP ratio, uh, why I didn't worry about it is because this is inherently uh, supposed to be temporary. Uh, and that's why wars, when wars occur, you actually shoot up your debt to GDP. You finance the war by issuing a lot of bonds. This is, of course, a big issue in the U.S. where they had all these bond drives and so forth, and debt to GDP went to uh, uh, highest levels in U.S. history. Uh, 
that uh, I mean, maybe there uh, again, but as long as you know it's temporary and you'll get back to normal and pay back that debt, you're fine. There is a concern here that, uh, that there are a lot of politicians that say, no, let's, you know, let's not worry about uh, 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 deficits. And, you know, we already spent it for here, but let's now have big infrastructure programs and so forth and so on uh, in order to, uh, uh, to boost up the economy. And, and that actually could be very dangerous. If that happens, uh, you could get a situation, everything looks fine for a while, and then all of a sudden, these things uh, uh, sometimes uh, explode, and all of a sudden, people aren't willing to buy the government debt, and that actually leads to an inflation crisis. So that's also not out of the picture. So, you know, this is not for Jay Powell to discuss, but for other people to sit there and say, look, it was good that we, that we basically spent trillions of dollars in this episode, because this was an act of God. This is like a wartime thing that either you, you know, eventually is over, if it's a major war, you know, not like a forever war like Afghanistan, but a really big, big war. Uh, either you, it's over because you lose or it's over because you win. And actually that should be the same thing here, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that this should all be tempered. I do really worry that the, uh, that the way people in Congress talk, and this is actually from both parties, uh, that this increase in spending may lead to further increases in spending. And then the potential for inflation is actually serious as well. Well, and if, and if there is inflation, then interest rates are going to go up. Yep, absolutely. And while real interest rates may stay low, so the debt deflation problem that you were concerned, that the question was concerned about is less of a problem, but you have a completely different set and a complete mess, um, uh, particularly in a country that is generically as indebted to the rest of the world as the United States. Because the dollar is the benchmark currency for everybody, everybody loves to hold our debt, both private and public. And in this sort of a situation, they don't tend to want to hold your debt so much. And that will be unbelievably costly across the board for absolutely everybody um, in the U.S. if that happens, uh, in addition to being, infl in addition to be to being um, inflationary. That's definitely not the kind of inflation you want. This is a question from Kim. Um, it's pretty straightforward. What, what would it take for the Fed to buy equities, not just debt? Um, Trish, do you want to tackle that one first? Uh, okay, so neither Rick nor I are Fed lawyers, so let me start with that caveat. Uh, but I have, I have been repeatedly informed by a current former uh, uh, Federal Reserve lawyer is that the answer to that is, is no, even through the special purpose vehicles structures that the Fed is, is using now to buy uh, the kinds of debt instruments that they typically cannot, they're forbidden by law to put directly on their own portfolio. And the reason is, is that those structures from a legal perspective need to be structured as loans. Both the assets that go in are loans or debt contracts of some kind, so bonds are allowed. Um, and then the Fed lends to them who then lends on to the, the private sector entity. And so ultimately the loan, they look through the special purpose vehicle to the lending that they're doing directly to whatever company or security was, uh, that, was, that was put into the SPV. But, a, but stock is stock. Uh, it's an ownership claim. It's not debt. And so, uh, and now I'm really, really hoping there are no uh, current or former Federal Reserve attorneys on this who, who are going to send me an email later and correct me uh, that I've got that wrong. Um, but that's my understanding um, of the law. Uh, and it is a legal question, not a, not a, uh, uh, not a risk tolerance question. I should point out, by the way, that uh... Here's what's in the law, that, uh, but you can get around it. Uh, when the Fed actually bought, uh, they, they actually did uh, uh, buy Bear Stearns assets. Now they did it from things that were non-recourse loans. So legally, it was actually, Paul Volcker was viewed as criticizing the Fed when he said that the Fed went to its legal li uh, limits of its authority. Yes. Uh, I didn't well, the SPVs, are the, the SPVs are indeed the legal limit of their, the, yeah. as and far so as in fact, tell. there are clever things to do. I, I do think that, uh, uh, buying equity, it's bad enough if you actually buy corporate bonds. Uh, the moral hazard issues there are serious. It's also a question of who's picking winners and so forth. Going to equity is another is, is a, a further step. Uh, you really worry that that's a bridge too far. So uh, uh, the Fed will, uh, uh, even if they could figure out how to do it with some legal shenanigans, uh, they were not going to, going to want to do it. Uh, yeah. It would have to be something super disastrous happening. Uh, 
it is really very, very dangerous. The Fed is enough of a dangerous position in terms of actually uh, lending to private companies, uh, uh, basically in a program with the Treasury, which it, it had, already means the Fed in some sense has given up some independence. Uh, could also be at the Fed, Fed peg, pegs rates. Uh, this is like the Fed before the Fed Treasury Court in 1951, for those of you who are monetary aficionados, where the Fed was uh, uh, under obligation from the Treasury to keep rates uh, from going up. Uh, and then they got their independence back in 1951. This is all dangerous territory, and it's territory that the Fed uh, uh, does not want to go into and should make very clear that it does not want to go there. So, so Rick, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So do you think they're going to need a new, a, a revised accord at the end of all of this? I don't know. Uh, I think right just, now the answer is uh, no, uh, because the basis if they do uh, uh, this pegging of interest rates, it will be done by the Fed's choice and not with the Treasury uh, yeah. involved. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's going to be very clear. The Fed is going to make that very clear. It's a monetary oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh We want to keep rates low. This is a way to do it. The Reserve Bank of Australia, for example, has just done this recently. I don't see that as a problem. The, the Treasury, the problem was that, that uh, in this case, the Fed was made actually subservient to the Treasury. And for those who know about the history, there were, this was done because of World War II was rightfully, the most important thing was to sell bonds so you could pay for all those tanks to beat Hitler. I mean, this is, you know, this is important stuff. Uh, that, so there was this agreement made and, uh, uh, and basically uh, the Treasury press didn't want to give it up because it made it easy for them to sell bonds. And it eventually was adjudicated by Eisenhower, and Eisenhower handled it extremely well. Uh, uh, you know, he's always been an underrated president, but he really handled this uh, very well. He gave the Fed back its independence. So I think that the answer is the way that they would do it would specifically not have the Treasury involved. And so I think in that context, uh, that would be very different. If they got the Treasury involved, this is one of the reasons why you get a little nervous about this backstop from the Treasury, because those programs are basically, and as you, as you rightfully point out, Trish, it's the Treasury has to decide how much risk to take. So that actually makes the Fed subservient. And, uh, uh, and again, I think that that, that, that is necessary. But uh, 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 at this point, it's not an issue that the Treasury just needs to sell its bonds. Uh, and that's why and that's why the Fed Treasury Accord, that's why the, um, the agreement was made with the Treasury. Uh, this is a case where the Fed does it, it's monetary policy. And so I don't see that as, as, uh, as creating uh, the problem because they could just say, we're doing it, and then we, we think we shouldn't do it anymore. We're going to get rid of it, uh, which is actually the way the, the what happened after the Treasury Court. The Fed uh, did not instantaneously give, give them the right to do whatever it wanted. The agreement was that the Fed uh, would, would basically do things slowly, and then just after things quieted down, they just basically said to the Treasury, see you later, boys. Yeah. Uh, and so that was the way it worked out. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, I think that that's about all that we have time for. I hope you didn't come today looking for a fight because Trish and Rick agreed on a lot. <laughs> and we actually <laughs> have been friends since yeah. 1980. Oh, do, I, do you want to admit this? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, where uh, uh, I had an Isro, the big head of hair around me, and, and, and Trish, Trish, I don't know whether she's coloring her hair or not, but she didn't have to. <laughs> we were both a lot younger, that's for we sure. We were both kids. Well, no, it was still a very, very interesting discussion. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to Trish and Rick for um, this great discussion being uh, our panelists today. And we hope that um, you'll join, join us again for another discussion with Columbia. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Afternoon, everyone.